hi, and welcome to everybody joining us today. Um, we're really excited for our eighth Geo Think and Learn on data-driven journalism. I also wanted to extend a very warm welcome to all of our panelists for being here today. We're excited to have you join us. My name is Drew Bush, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Geography at, uh, with GeoThink at McGill University. And just quickly, before I turn things over to John Corbett to introduce all of our speakers and GeoThink itself, I wanted to just go through a couple features for attendees so that you'll know how to interact with our panel when the time comes. So the first thing that you'll notice at the top of your screen is that there are a couple buttons that you can click on. The first is a raise your hand feature. Um, this feature allows you to actually pose questions verbally um, and share your video screen as a part of the session to, for our panelists. And just so you know, we are recording this entire session to put on our website after, the, after we're concluded today. So if you would like to be a part of that, this is one way that you can do that. The other two ways that you have to interact with our panelists are the two buttons that you'll see that say Q&A and chat. You'll see already that in our chat, Sonia Solomon, GeoThink's project manager, has already welcomed everybody, but here's a good place to get involved in the discussion, to ask questions if you'd like, um, or to make comments. And then finally, the Q&A button gives you two options as an attendee to ask questions of our panelists. And if you click on that button, you'll see that you actually can ask a question in written form. Our panelists will be responding to them as the presentation takes place if they can, but we will also be reading these questions during our Q&A session and giving our chance to our panelists a chance to respond to them verbally as well. So those are the main, way, main ways to be involved. Um, apologies if you did dial in just on a telephone today, you don't have these options, but we appreciate you dialing in to learn. Um, if you're on a tablet device and you're having trouble with any of these features, feel free to chat towards me, Drew Bush, and I can try to help you work that out. So those are all the notes I had for everybody. So I would like to now start our session and turn it over to our convener, Dr. John Corbett at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. Place, Okanagan. But you, oh, you get there. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about GeoThink and why we find ourselves here, a bunch of journalists, um, you know, talking about open data within the context of GeoThink. Um, and then I'm very, gonna very quickly introduce um, all, of our, uh, all of our speakers. Um, so GeoThink was a project that's funded as a part of the partnership grant scheme through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or SHER. Um, it's a really notable type of funding um, because it will involve partners across uh, both Canada, but then more broadly also internationally. It involves also not just a bunch of academics, but also academics working alongside community partners. Um, so the substance of our partnership grant called GeoThink has been looking at the role of data, particularly open data, as a means to influence um, governments, but also for governments to be able to influence people. Um, and so um, the interesting thing is that as the project's grown, then the number of people involved with the project has sort of concomitantly grown as well. And one of the individuals that came on board relatively early on in the project was April Lindgren from Ryerson University, who then started to really introduce the sort of issue of journalism and how we can think about open data within the context of, of addressing this issue around news poverty or the closure of small journalistic outlet, um, outlets, particularly in rural areas um, throughout, these, uh, throughout, uh, throughout Canada. Um, and I think it's turned out to be a sort of a fascinating partnership between April um, and then more broadly, uh, the GeoThink project. And I think that this is a sort of pivotal moment as to why we find ourselves right now doing, doing this particular panel discussion around big data um, and journalism. I mean, there can be no time more relevant than right now. We just need to be, um, you know, reading the news every morning to discover the significance of working with large data sets as a means to influence the way that people think about society. Um, so this really is an extremely timely discussion. So um, our speakers this morning, we have uh, Roberto Rocha, um, uh, an investigative journalist from CBC. Uh, we have Fred Valance J Jones, an associate pref pre professor in the School of Journalism at the University of King's College in Halifax. 
We have April Lindgren, an associate professor at Ryerson School of Journalism, and Zane Schwartz, the 2017 Michelle Lang Fellow at the National Post. Um, so just as a, as a means of sort of a, a trying to provide some structure here, each of the speakers has eight minutes. We'll just go from one speaker to the next, and then we'll open up the, we'll open up the panel for discussion. Thank you all for being here today. And so we'll start with April Lindgren. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, it was a great opportunity and a, and a great uh, chance for us to, John and I, to actually create, um, I think, one of our, uh, a really successful project, which was to create something we call um, the local news map. Um, so we launched it in, um, in June 2016. And the idea is that the map is um, a crowdsourced online uh, resource where people from across the country who are most familiar with, with what's happening in their local news environments to um, go in and put markers on the map that tell us when a news organization closes, when a new uh, news or local news organization launch, launches, when there's a service reduction. And the map, um, over the last two years, uh, we, we can download CSV and CSVs or data from the map. And uh, it's become uh, a real go-to resource for uh, much of the uh, writing and discussion that people are having about what's going on in Canada. Because one of our challenges with such a big country um, uh, as is, is, is trying to track what's going on locally. Um, so it's, it's local news that, that is my particular interest in the context of today's conversation. Um, and, and local news that is really facing a whole bunch of challenges. Um, the latest data from the map that we downloaded uh, a week or so ago um, showed that there were 244 news organizations that have closed um, uh, in 181 communities across Canada since uh, 2008. Um, by comparison, only uh, about uh, another 60 have reduced services in their communities. I'm just looking at the data here. Um, and only there's only 75 um, new launches of new organizations on the map. Now, I mean, it's crowdsourced, so some of the um, so obviously it's only as good as the data on the map and the people who, are, who participate. But um, but I think there's a trend there, a four to one trend, which is uh, which is kind of disturbing. Well, more than kind of disturbing. So in the context of today's uh, uh, that that's sort of setting the scene for today's talk, and I, I just want to talk about data journalism and local news in particular, and make the point that um, I think the capacity of local news organizations to mine. Uh, open data uh, or any kind of data for stories is really lagging behind the growing availability of, of data sources. Um, and I think the reasons for that are, are twofold. One is that most uh, local journalists, I think, still lack the necessary skills to be able to clean and use and interrogate uh, data to, to, to pull stories from it. And secondly, um, you know, increasingly, you know, Fred's uh, university and our university are graduating people who have some have these skills. Um, but though if they arrive at a local news organization, the demands on their time are so intense to just get out the daily um, uh, news product that there's not a lot of time for these um, sorts of projects, even if they do have um, the capacity. So I thought that uh, there's some models that we could look at for how to um, make local news, uh, make data journalism and the results and the, the rich richness of it uh, more available to um, to uh, communities across the country. And this, of course, is inspired in part by the $50 million that the federal government's put on the table um, to bolster local news um, uh, over the next five years. And their focus is that it, the money will be spent in what they call underserviced areas, and uh, it'll be funneled through um, uh, uh, not-for-profit uh, or non-governmental uh, organizations, um, which I guess means private, it can be private sector, university, there's lots of options out there for this. So basically, I think that the field is wide open for proposals, and I think there's a space for data journalism. So what I'm going to propose is, um, is a, 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 a shared data lab, basically. Uh, and it's modeled, the idea is modeled on two projects that are already underway in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and one of them is uh, the BBC's uh, uh, Local News uh, Partnerships uh, Shared Data Unit. So in that case, it brings journalists from across the UK in on three months secondments to work with the data journalists at the BBC. Um, and they identify and prepare data that will generate national stories, but with also that also will have a strong local angle. So, for instance, um, they most recently recently did a project on the um, uh, lack of or the declines in 
uh, bus service across the UK. Um, so they produced this national story that showed what the trends were, and then um, the data they made available to local news organizations also could, where, where people were able to adapt them to tell the, the local story of what was happening to bus service in, the, in their communities. Um, and what's interesting, and I think is a necessary uh, ingredient to this sort of project, is that the um, the, uh, the the centralized unit at the BBC also produced, a, in a sense, a story recipe or a background document uh, that went out and was made available to local journalists as well that had uh, said, why, why does this story matter now? Because the government's thinking about further cuts to bus service. Um, why does bus service matter to these communities? How do you use the data? How do you make sense of the data set? And it was it's pretty user friendly uh, format. And then how do you, um, uh, they had some Q&A uh, elements um, sessions with experts that uh, local journalists could just draw the expertise from, put in their stories, and uh, and some samples of how local stories could be could be produced out of this project. Um, and there was quite a lot of pickup of these stories um, um, uh, acro across all of the UK, and people telling uh, taking the data and writing for their local media about it. And then the second example, also from the UK, is called the Bureau Local, and it's run um, by the not-for-profit Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, and it's uh, also has created a collaborative network of journalists. Um, they uh, again pull together, identify data that has a national angle, but as for an investigative piece, but that also has strong local elements that can be uh, adapted for local use. Um, a couple of the projects they've done quite successfully was the um, was a project that looked at. Uh, how funding cuts to uh, shelters for uh, uh, women uh, victims of domestic violence are uh, reducing access and many people are being turned away. So there was a national story, they, pr they produced a national story and then um, shared uh, the data with, um, there's, I think it's up to uh, um, hundreds of partners at this point. And, uh, and the result were a whole bunch of local stories on what's the situation for these uh, shelters in, uh, in the local communities. Um, yeah, they have 700 uh, partners in, in the project. So I think both of those um, are, are great examples. Um, and I'm not sure where I am in terms of time, but, uh, but we have a, a, another of the projects that the Bureau Local did um, was one of their partnerships. Uh, partners um, mentioned uh, issues with the way sweeps were being done by immigration authorities and, uh, and targeting people based on race, basically, and picking up a whole bunch of British citizens in the, in the process. So again, yet another story that uh, produced a lot of local coverage. And since um, the timing is, uh, is right, I'm just going to say we had just this past week had a great example here in Canada of this, and that's uh, Zane's project where he pulled together data on the funding of um, uh, donations to political parties. And uh, I mean, it's a classic and perfect example of how um, anybody, local reporter looking for a story can type in their MP or the constituency association or even a donor and, um, and find out what's going on. Now, of course, my pitch is that we should create this unit uh, for, um, at a great journalism school like Ryerson. Um, but uh, I can also see that it would have the potential to um, you know, have a big impact on, on the quality of local journalism going forward um, if it even was working in collaboration with something like Canadian Press Wire Service, which has um, a whole bunch of natural partners in that sense. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you, April. Thank you, April. And our next speaker is going to be Zane Schwartz. Thank you, Drew. Um, so I um, sort of uh, somewhat in the same vein of what April's discussing. Um, I'm a, a big believer in uh, sort of the, the data work that I do, trying to make it as accessible for other uh, journalists as possible, uh, partially for just incredibly pragmatic reasons. As uh, resources are declining, it's difficult to um, do all the stories that you would necessarily want to do. And so um, one of the things that uh, we just published was uh, a database of uh, six million donations over the past decade in every province and territory. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen because uh, I think that um, a uh, much more talented designer than I at the National Post built it, and it'll give you a sense of, sort of what I'm talking about. Um, so there's a microsite for this project. 
um, and the core of it is this database. So in Canada, all donations are public, but they're usually kept in formats which are very difficult to search. So for example, if you wanted to look up who the biggest donors were in Saskatchewan, where there are no limits on how much you can donate, they accept unlimited foreign money, they accept um, unlimited corporate union money. Uh, under the system as of a week ago, what you would do is you would download PDFs and you would have to look up a name and then it's uh, divided by party and divided by year. So if you wanted to determine, let's say, who the biggest donor was in Saskatchewan in the most recent election, uh, you could do it, but it would be quite cumbersome. So what we did is we took this data and converted it from PDF by using optical character recognition technology, um, uh, mostly Comet Docs, which is the uh, technology of choice of the investigative reporters and editors, the, the US organization, um, and converted it into uh, uh, .csv file, which then allowed us to put it into the searchable database. So for example, if you go to Saskatchewan, uh, there's 35 million donations recorded in the database from 2006 up until 2016. Uh, and you can look at, let's say, say I'm interested in the ruling Saskatchewan party. Uh, so the Saskatchewan party has brought in nearly two thirds of the money. Uh, it's so 23, closer to 24 million. Uh, if you've got a specific donor in mind, uh, you can look them up. Uh, for example, um, if you look up Rolko Radio, um, which as we're talking journalism, um, they are a, uh, one of the larger radio stations in the province um, and uh, sort of anomalous to most media companies, also one of the big ones. So not only do they give through um, their own name, but also if you go to the highlights section, you can see that they use a numbered company, which is something that's been a law at the federal level for about um, but a decade now, but it's still okay here. Uh, so, number of companies are allowed to donate not only in Saskatchewan, but in Newfoundland and Prince Rhode Island. Um, and uh, sorry, actually, it's in the future story section. Um, so, in addition to the database, I pulled out some uh, questionable donations. So, for example, um, here it goes, um, if you look at that section. Um, so these are, this is one of the things that I've had interesting, all of this data is nominally public. So in Saskatchewan, there's a corporate registry, you can look at the number of companies. But it costs $25 a pop, so for your average consumer, your average uh, citizen, you're not going to necessarily think, oh, what is 565509 Saskatchewan? So uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with this is take the database of political donations and then hopefully um, over the, the next little while, I hope people cross-reference it thing, with things like corporate databases, lobbyist registry databases. So you can see sort of who is actually giving the money, uh, who are sort of some of the power players here. Um, so uh, a group of about a dozen of us uh, at the Post and at the Calgary Herald uh, identified some of the highlights, which I'll sort of go through quickly because they're sort of representative. Um, so uh, one of the things that we noticed was that a lot of money that's going, being donated to Justin Trudeau's writings actually coming from BC, um, which sort of makes sense when you think about the cash for access um, fundraisers that were often happening on the West Coast. Um, we were looking at uh, numbered companies. So it's only, there's only a little over 200 numbered companies that are actually donating in Saskatchewan but uh, it's 3 million of 35 million. So about 10% of all money raised in Saskatchewan is coming through these anonymous vehicles. Um, and Saskatchewan is really interesting because uh, in the past two years, British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, and New Brunswick have all severely capped the way the fundraising works. So none of those provinces allow corporate union donations anymore, and they all have fairly strict caps. Uh, but, um, you still have four parts of Canada which are now unlimited foreign money. So if we're talking about, uh, there's so much focus on the Russian interference in the American election, but uh, for example, state-owned Malaysian and Chinese companies can just give directly to politicians and, and have uh, in Saskatchewan, in Newfoundland, in Prince Edward Island. Um, and especially in some of these smaller jurisdictions, 
So in Yukon, for example, um, uh, in the Yukon, there were, uh, in the most recent election, they received a $50,000 donation from a BC mining company, which may not sound like a lot of money, but the Yukon Liberal Party, which went on to win the election and then 11 years of uh, Yukon Party rule, that's a quarter of all money that they raised. So in some of these smaller jurisdictions in Canada, where there are fewer journalists than there were before, uh, donations like this may slip through the cracks because it's partially from what April was discussing in terms of how busy everyone is. Um, and uh, what happens though is that it's a quarter of all money raised and it's from a company that uh, just got, there was a $360 million announcement by the territory and the federal government to build mining roads, not exclusively for this company, but partially for this company. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I find so interesting about this project is that I know we've only scraped the surface um, and uh, April wrote a really good piece in the conversation yesterday, which I was just sort of reading right before this. And the point that she made, which I think is absolutely true, is that there are stories in here that uh, we are definitely uh, going to miss, not be aware of, and there's potentially stories all over the country. If you put in, uh, let's say, who your member of parliament is donated to, where your member of parliament is getting money from, there's all uh, there's six million donations in total. Um, there's all kinds of potential for uh, interesting things in there. Um, I've got about a minute left. I want to just quickly show you. So, in addition to the searchable database at the top of this, we've also built some tools highlight certain aspects. So the regional donations allows you to see money flows between provinces. So for example, some of the biggest donors in Alberta also play uh, an outsized role in BC and Saskatchewan. Uh, a lot of Ontario money plays a role out east. Um, donations over time. So if you wanna, uh, for example, look at the Alberta NDP, um, I mean, this won't be surprising to anybody, but they sort of come out of nowhere and in the past two years raise significantly more money than they have at any point. Um, and then finally, the biggest donors tool, which is uh, for me probably the most exciting one, you can look up, let's say, um, Kathleen Wynn. Um, oh, I've got this. I just look up Kathleen Wynn and you can see who were the biggest donors in Kathleen Wynn's leadership campaign. Uh, so you've got people aggregate donors. Um, or you can even just look at who the biggest donors were in Alberta or in Alberta in 2016. Um, so yeah, we're really hoping that this kind of project, this kind of collaboration, um, I mean, there's all kinds of exciting things going on in Canada. I told them that I recently made all of their, a lot of their backend tools on GitHub. So if you want to build charts using the Global Mills tools, you can do that. Um, and I, I know, I think there's sort of a, a nice trend in Canadian media towards more open data that makes me really excited. Thank you so much, Zane. That was a really interesting database. And uh, our next speaker now will be Roberto Roca. Hi, everyone. My name's Roberto. I'm a data journalist at the CBC uh, in Montreal, but I'm part of an, an investigative uh, national team uh, where we uh, do data-driven uh, national stories, national, uh, with national scope. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, not so much what I do or what data journalism is, but it's a major change, a major shift that's happening in data journalism. Uh, started a few years ago, uh, ago uh, where uh, the data journalist's role or how he, how the journal, data journalist perceives himself has shifted from someone who just sort of organizes and, and presents data to more of an active storyteller who uh, uh, takes a, a more active role in choosing what story uh, is important, what is uh, told. So I'm just going to um, put on my slides here. It's because data journalism in its very essence, it's, it's journalism. The journalism is the keyword here. And journalism is all about um, filtering and finding the main story and telling that story in an engaging way. So let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, when data journalism in its early days, uh, we thought that we should just throw everything at the reader. 
right? To just give them all the information we found and let the reader kind of explore it. It was for this kitchen sink um, approach to uh, telling stories. So you'd see things like um, these long searchable databases, right? Where um, uh, that would just be completely unfriendly and then un unappealing to, to explore. If you look at the bottom here, there's 6,000, almost 6,900 records over many pages that you have to click on and click on and see and, and see things with an accompanying text. But mostly it was just, you know, uh, go ahead and explore this. Or look at this, uh, this hideous uh, map that I made years ago. It still makes me cringe when I look at it um, of uh, bike accidents by intersection in Montreal, color coded by how many accidents there were in that intersection. And again, the, the prevailing idea was um, let the reader uh, explore it. They want to uh, dig into, into the data and find the story that interests them inside it. Um, you have, uh, this went to absurd degrees, like uh, you, know, you have these maps of uh, uh, pubs, clickable maps of pubs in the UK that just cover the entire territory and uh, don't do much to, um, to clarify the world to readers. And this was basically telling the audience, you figure out the story. I won't do it for you, you do it, right? And this is an abdication of the journalist's role as a storyteller. Uh, my role is to do that work for the reader, so he doesn't have to. Uh, so this realization has, uh, has slowly um, come more and more, become more and more mainstream, thanks in part to metrics. Um, so, pop quiz. Um, let's, let's consider the New York Times, which is a very uh, rich news organization. They can hire some of the best web developers, some of the best interactive um, developers, uh, UX designers. So, logically, you would assume that they make some of the best interactive, uh, clickable uh, visualizations um, in journalism. I uh, want you all to guess, just throw out a number at me, unmute your, unmute your uh, microphones and guess what percentage of their visitors actually engage with these graphics. 2%. 5%. 5%. 7%. 10%. Uh, wow, it just feels like uh, an auction. Everybody's going up. So um, you are all incredibly pessimistic. It's a little bit higher than that. It's 15%. 15% of their readers actually engage, with, which means that still the vast majority, 85%, don't engage with these uh, interactives, right? Which is a shame because these things are expensive to make. You know, making good interactive uh, visualizations is expensive, uh, especially when you have to make it work on different devices, different screen sizes, right? Mobile phones, uh, making it so fat fingers, fat clumsy fingers can actually, you know, click on these things. Uh, but turns out that all that work was in vain because people are lazy. Journal, uh, readers are lazy. Readers don't want to work to get information. Maybe basically, they just want to scroll. So with this information, uh, these sort of new, new, um, new, co new commandments of visual storytelling have started uh, being uh, developed. And this is one version by Archie C, who's a deputy graphics director of the New York Times. This is something he presented a few years back at this conference called Malofier for uh, visual design. I'm just gonna go quickly uh, go through it. Rule number one, if you make the reader click or do anything other than scroll, something spectacular has to happen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what spectacular means. Number two, if you make a tooltip or a rollover, assume no one will ever see it. If content is important for readers to see it, don't hide it. In other words, don't force the reader to work to get information. And three, when deciding whether to make something interactive, remember that getting it to work on all platforms is expensive, like we said. So with these new principles in mind, we've been seeing a shift on how uh, data journalists have been presenting stories, at least visually, like you know, with text, with the TV, you know, that, that hasn't changed. You're still, you're still coming up with a nice narrative, but when you're presenting it visually, uh, things have been changing over the past few years. 
uh, and the, the visual data journalist has taken more of a role as an active storyteller and deciding what the story is instead of making, uh, let it, uh, forcing the reader to figure it out. So here's a brilliant example that just came out, uh, came out last week of the New York Times. It's a story about how um, in the US, um, black men, even if they are born into rich families, most, most of them end up as poor adults. Uh, whereas uh, white men uh, usually tend to stay in their um, in their social class, and they presented this in this animated, brilliant way that you see them literally falling, and it just shows you that you know the uh, the idea of the American dream is not the same uh, for all races. It's a very clear story with uh, um, instead of having you know all these graphics that you can click on and choose your own adventure. No, here's here's uh, here's what we found. Another. Great example of this by BuzzFeed, where they were able to identify it among hundreds of thousands of records of uh, air, airplane traje trajectories. They were able to identify some that were uh, American spy planes, government spy planes, surveillance planes, uh, by these um, characteristic uh, circle uh, patterns that they were flying in. And they, also, they animated this map so that uh, you can see how it uh, changes over time. The um, 538 uh, did this really nice uh, look at how 311 calls in New York kept coming after Hurricane Sandy years ago, but about Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and you see that at the beginning, it starts really big, a lot of calls, a big volume of calls, but even years later, the city still gets calls about people on uh, either concerned about the flood damage or, 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 or uh, health um, problems um, years later or insurance problems. And it's all scrolling, right? Again, they could have made this a, a clickable thing, but no, they decided to just uh, <coughs> tell a chronological story uh, vertically like this. Here's one that we did at the CBC when it was hurricane season. I saw a lot of maps, uh, interactive maps about like, here are all the hurricanes that we had in the world. And you had to you know, hover each, uh, over each one of them and find out how strong they were and when they came. But we thought it was better to just present it all in first of all, this big uh, overall map, but then break it down visually like this, scrolling about each of the hurricanes that passed through Canada and how strong they were. So uh, you can just absorb this through uh, the very normal uh, act of scrolling. Uh, census data is also one that gets abused a lot by making people click on maps and here's what your neighborhood is, right? And a lot of people don't care. So um, break it out into, we broke it out into several different maps, different thematic maps about different languages, about uh, density, about um, the spread of, uh, of, <clears throat> of uh, non-English and non-French speakers over time. Again, a lot of animation, or you've been seeing a lot of animations here. Animation is a very powerful way of replacing inter uh, in needless interactivity. So, uh, what's spectacular, right? When, the, when you, if you force someone to click on something, something spectacular has to happen. That was one of the rules of visual storytelling. Well, there is still a place for interactivity, right? That doesn't mean that you should uh, just uh, get rid of it altogether but it's still justified when there's a strong me factor, when it lets the uh, reader uh, find themselves in the data and see themselves as, as a part of the context. Here's one that uh, we did at the CBC, actually William Wolf Wiley, who was supposed to join us, he wasn't able to today, unfortunately, did this really nice um, census explorer where you tell a little bit about yourself in the beginning and then it gives you this sort of personalized um, report about how you fit within the Canadian population according to the census. Uh, the Globe and Mail did a fantastic one where you punch in your uh, city and uh, your parents um, sort of in, uh, income, um, income rank and it tells you what's the likelihood of you either ending up at a higher income rank or a lower income rank than your parents. Uh, one, one that we did for Montreal for, um, for uh, the 375th anniversary of the city. 
we did a map that has pretty much uh, all of the buildings in the city colored by their year of construction. And it's a fully interactive map. You can go in and explore it, but that's kind of optional, right? The, the main part of it is th that when you scroll down on this right pane, the, um, which was about 30 iconic uh, buildings, historical buildings, and to profile them. And as you scroll it down, the map zooms and pans automatically to where they are. But at any time, you can explore the map yourself. So the option is still there. Um, I think this one uh, lended itself well to interactivity too. It was a visual look at 10,000 Kickstarter projects in Canada by Canadians, about <clears throat> grouped by where they were and their category. So right away, it tells you that while well, Toronto has you know and has the most projects, but um, it also tells you the relative strengths of each city. You see that Montreal is big on games or a big video game industry. So it makes sense, right? Toronto is big on film and video and design. Vancouver is also strong on, on film, right? It kind of confirms these, um, these uh, what we think we know about cities and their uh, sort of cultural business uh, strengths. But it also lets you explore deeper if you want, right? It's not, you're not forced to do it. But if you want, you can click on the bubble and see more information about each project. And um, I think I've, I've been talking enough. This is another one we did about car to go where it shows the relative concentration of cars in the city based on time of day. Where again, uh, there's a general map that tells you where cars are most likely to be found and what time of day. But if you want to know more, again, it's uh, you, can, you can click on the thing and see sort of this histogram of uh, number of cars by uh, time of day in that region if you want to maximize your chances of finding a car or if you're you know angry that all these shared cars are taking up uh, places and you want a confirmation of that. So that's me. That's my spiel. That's all I got. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Roberto. And now we'll hear from our final speaker, Fred Valance-Jones. Fred, I think you need to unmute. Okay, there we go, unmuted. Uh, back to sharing the screen again. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Um, I was just listening along there. I was saying I was so uh, uh, so excited to hear about some of the other projects uh, today. Uh, uh, the, the work that you've been doing, April at Ryerson, and. Uh, and Zane's amazing uh, political donations uh, project, and of course everything that uh, Roberto's doing at the CBC. Uh, I kind of come from uh, what you might call the, uh, the prehistoric days of data journalism, uh, before there was ever any, uh, really any, any internet in anybody's eye from the early to mid 90s, and we we're building uh, basically stories from data, and mostly it was big investigative stories. Uh, the sort of thing that uh, Roberto has shown you uh, really didn't, uh, didn't exist yet, uh, at all. Um, and I think there are sort of three things that fall under this, uh, uh, this umbrella of data journalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, it can really range from, uh, you know, working with an Excel uh, spreadsheet to sort of sort, uh, uh, say, the, the increase given to a police budget, or it can go on from there to uh, perhaps the, the sort of more investigative stuff. And then, of course, all this data viz stuff that Roberto's been talking about. So it's a big umbrella. Um, and, and typically, uh, data journalism has tended to be focused on, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, the present, uh, what's going on right now. Uh, and uh, so sometimes, sometimes we can delve into the past. And that's what I did with my class here at King's. We have a, a Master of Journalism program uh, in, in investigative and data journalism. And uh, I was working with my third year research class uh, on a project commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion, which I think, as you all know, uh, December 6, 1917, ship blows up in the harbor, destroys a good part of the city. Um, originally, it was really just a chance for the third years to figure out uh, how to uh, use archival records. And I'm just going to sort of show you a picture of the kinds of 
things that the students dug up out of the archives. This is a picture of sort of survivors clambering over the ruins. Um, so originally it had been for that purpose, but then we thought, well, maybe we could use, uh, get the data class involved and maybe we could recreate uh, Halifax in 1917 uh, in a map. Um, and so that's sort of what we, we set out to do. Uh, and we were, of course, using a GIS, a Geographic Information System, which I think most people on will know what that is. Um, uh, there were no shape files, though, sort of available open data files that, you know, you could find on uh, the, uh, what Halifax looked like in 1917 and the street patterns. So essentially, we had to, to, to build that ourselves. Uh, I called around to some colleagues. Uh, discovered later that a, a colleague of mine over at Dell was was working on a similar project that he ended up doing uh, with the CBC, uh, quite different, but that was later. <laughs> so what would we do? So ultimately what we did was we discovered that the Nova Scotia archives um, kept, say, a map that had been created by what was called the Halifax Relief Commission, and that's a body that was created to uh, basically rebuild Halifax uh, as well as pay uh, pensions out to survivors of, of the various victims. Um, so this map was a paper map uh, built from insurance maps of the day, but it showed all the building footprints and how badly the uh, various buildings had been had been damaged. Um, so that became the basis for, for our work and we were able to ask the Nova Scotia archives to give us a uh, digitized copy uh, of this map uh, at a high resolution. So then what we did was uh, we used a functionality of a GIS called georeferencing, which you're probably familiar with, is where you take an image, say, or an old map, and you line it up with uh, the various uh, points uh, in, uh, on, a, on a map of today, a digital map of today, say, on a shapefile. Uh, so that's what we did. And uh, so here you can see the Halifax uh, explosion map uh, sort of lined up with the current street pattern of the city of Halifax. Um, this is actually a little harder than you'd think because a lot of the streets then uh, don't exist now, uh, but there were sort of key intersections and points that we could locate that were pretty much in exactly the same place. And by that, we were able to geo-reference the two maps. And from there, then we could do anything we wanted because now we could uh, build uh, a map of the streets of the day. And that's what this is. Uh, so you can see both the streets that line up, say, to the left side of the map with the, the current uh, street pattern, uh, but also uh, you can see down below towards the bottom where it was completely different. So now we had a, a street map uh, of Halifax uh, that we could work from. Um, next problem, though, was that the devastation map uh, had, a, had all of the buildings on it, and we wanted to draw those. And so how are we going to do that when we've got more than a thousand little polygons that represent all these buildings. So the answer was to divide the map up into 10 zones. So basically, relatively arbitrarily, but also keeping in mind which areas had more buildings than others. And then the students basically uh, drew all the little polygons by hand using ArcGIS Pro. Uh, each one had a couple of hundred to do. And, and that allowed us then to basically recreate today the devastation map uh, from, from that time. And you'll see this is sort of the two of them together. So you can see the green sort of polygons here represent uh, uh, various uh, uh, buildings uh, overlaid on the old map. So you see, you can see here the two layers, the, the old map and the new map with the polygons uh, drawn in. All right, so from there, uh, we, we turned that into a beautiful sort of digital map uh, that we could, uh, could then uh, convert into something online to, to show to the readers. And as Roberto was saying, what we wanted to do was allow people to sort of, you know, see sort of how today's world that they're living in relates to then. And, and so that's how, when we came up with the idea of going out and photographing um, all of uh, a bunch of the sort of key buildings of the day uh, uh, and, and, and the area uh, they, they have now and then comparing that to what they looked like at the time of the explosion. And the map allowed us to very precisely uh, sort of show where they were. Ultimately, uh, we also got the third years to, uh, to uh, take some paper records from the archives of damage surveys uh, and uh, turn, turn them into a spreadsheet, which we then also uh, put onto our map. And 
The final product was a map that, yes, had a lot of points on it, but what it allowed people to do was to then go find where they lived and see what was there before. Um, so we were, they were able to do that both with, with the buildings, which you can see on the right here. Uh, towards the bottom, you can see the damage surveys in, in green and how badly they were damaged. Um, but also they could look at, as well at the uh, uh, a precisely what the buildings were and how far they were from the explosion. Uh, finally, what we did, uh, it may take a few extra seconds because uh, I started on mute. Um, we also built a map uh, from the Remembrance book, which is, was all of the people known to have died in the explosion. We then geocoded all of those points, basically using the old city directory to tell us what the street ranges on the streets were at, at that time. Um, as well as using the building polygon map that I mentioned before that we built because it had addresses in it, um, which then allowed us to produce a map of every person's home who had died in the explosion. And uh, uh, that was also, uh, we worked on that alongside Global uh, News, who uh, also did a project based on the same geocoded uh, data that, that we had created. Uh, so the end result was uh, a project uh, that I think the students were, were, were quite proud of uh, and uh, sort of brought the story of the explosion to life in a, in a way perhaps it wasn't being told elsewhere. So it was quite actually unique in this uh, media market we did. And uh, if you're interested, you can see the, uh, the URL at the bottom there, signalhfx.ca slash 904.35 a.m and uh, that will take you to the project if you'd like to explore it uh, a, a little bit further. So th that's basically what, uh, what I was gonna talk about today. Thanks so much, Fred. That was a really wonderful project that you put together with your students. Um, and we're gonna start our Q&A session just in a moment here. I just wanna remind all of our attendees that there are three ways you can interact with our panelists. Um, of course, you can hit the raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen. And for some of you, this might be at the top of your screen. And I will get pinged and will promote you to share your video and your audio. The other two ways that you can ask questions are in our Q&A. So if you hit that button, you'll see that there are already a number of questions that have been asked. And you can ask questions using your name, or you can, if you prefer to be anonymous, ask questions anonymously as well. So um, I actually wanted to start with a question that I had um, for the panel. And in particular, um, I was thinking about some of what Roberto was saying in terms of the idea that these graphics involving data journalism really have to be not asking the reader to do more. And in particular, that they have to scroll down to use them. Um, and so you know, I was thinking a, a bit uh, in you know, whether or not this is in relation to the advent of tablet technology where clicking on links or doing more things might be harder to use. And I'm wondering, Roberto and the rest of the panel, how do you think you know, that story plays out? Is it shaped by sort of the tablet technology that a lot of people now interact with their news sources on? Um, and what are the reasons you know, more broadly for that as well? I think 100% it has to do with uh, mobile devices, uh, but phones, phones way more than, uh, than tablets, right? Tablets didn't, didn't catch on as much as uh, people thought it would, but phones, that's people are on their phones all the time, all day, right? This is what they're used to doing, and people don't want to do, really do more than that. Uh, and I think this kind of uh, also um, uh, translates to, you know, you're using your little scroll, um, scroll scroll button on your uh, on your mouse um, we just learn more about how people um, interact with things on the web um, by observing right by, by uh, with technology with uh, with metrics so this is absolutely changing how uh, you know how journalists need to think about how will people interact with this and it's something that's being slow to to um to catch on in newsrooms because there's still that idea that oh let's make it interactive let's make everything interactive right like interactive is still this like wonderful uh, panacea that's gonna you know um, make uh, any story more interesting but it's not it's really 
it's really back to basics. It's really no, no, you choose, like take that extra time to find out how to, the story is interesting. What are the interesting parts and present that in a uh, uh, piece me away. If I can jump in on that, uh, Roberto, I think, I think you're right. And um, people, I, I mean, there's a reason journalists work and identify what stories are. It's because we have to be the storytellers. So I think when people sign on or when they're looking at, a, at, at something, they don't want to have to figure out what the story is. They don't want to have to, you know, go and go all over the place to sort of make sense of it or provide or get the context. And um, I think part of the problem is we as journalists love these maps and the interactivity and they're fun to make and wow, isn't this cool? Um, but there's a, a bit of a disconnect there between how much uh, viewers and readers actually love them. Um, I would agree hundred percent. Um, I would just add that uh, as long as the tool is sort of serving uh, like an explicit editorial function, that's part of the reason why I keep pushing people towards the biggest donor tool is because when you're testing things out, that's what people want to know who gave the most money. So if we can aggregate that for them, um, it helps. And uh, yeah, the only thing that I'd add is uh, personally, as someone who loves big data, it's great when you can download the whole data set. But I mean, I think right now, like 12 people have downloaded it. Like this isn't something that most people are ever going to use. And we know that, but it's still uh, important to have as an option. Yeah, I think what your, um, what your project does well, uh, Zane, is that it, um, it combines the best of the two types of, uh, well, the, it combines the two main uh, interactive storytelling techniques, which is the narrow technique, which is I am the storyteller. I, am, I decide what is here. You are going to follow my lead. And there's also the sandbox approach, which is here's all the data. Have fun with it, right? What you do is what's, what's also often called the martini glass approach, where it starts narrow. All right, here's what I think is important. Here's my, uh, my, my, what I decided as a storyteller is what you should know. And then it expands like a martini glass into, now you can go play with it and go deeper on your own. And I think that's a great approach to do with the interactive uh, uh, journalism. I'm a fan of anything martini based, so sounds good. <laughs> also, you know, I mean, this whole conversation points to the, 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 the sort of idea that I was describing earlier, which is local journalists can go in and take the data and make it relevant to their local audiences and, and do that work for, for the, the people that live in their communities, ideally. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, saying that more local journalists will see what you, you, you've done and, and recognize what a gift it is in terms of like a story in hand. I, I know our students at Ryerson um, typed in, um, I, I think they did this, the uh, president, name of the president of the university to see who he's been giving money to. Like, there's a local story, right? It's a gift. First person my colleagues looked up was Paul Godfrey. He's a big donor. Anyway. Um, I, I, kind of, I, I, I was actually going to specifically ask that question as well, but to, to, to Zane, you know, Given what Roberto said, has, uh, does it made you rethink perhaps how you should be presenting some of the statistics and follow the money? I mean, follow the money is a, an amazing tool. I really might hat off to you, but at the same time, it it's predicated first of all on you having a, a quite a, a, you know an, a, a, how to say an in depth knowledge of, of the sort of funding type um, landscape, and then secondly, you know the fact that you've got to be doing drop downs and constructing you know relatively complex SQL queries in order to get to the data that you find interesting. So some of the things that Roberto said, does it make you rethink perhaps some of the sort of design components of, of follow the money? Um, not really. So if you look at the, I focused a bit maybe too much on the actual database, but we spent quite a bit of time pulling things out and trying to make things easy for people. It's probably the biggest one is we identified the 10 biggest donors in every province of the territory except for Quebec. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Even if you're doing those complex queries, you're not necessarily going to know all the subsidiaries of a company or what the acronym for a local union might stand for. So if you look at, you know, um, British Columbia, for example, we've done all that. And we did corporate record searches. So if people have the same uh, directors and stuff, we've aggregated all of that. There's a highlight section where we identify things that we think are interesting. Um, but also there's no SQL involved. So it's a responsive database. If you start typing in Zane, 
Um, it'll give you all of the zanes. Right. Type in uh, Schwartz, it'll give you all of the Schwartzes. It's not perfect, uh, of course, but uh, we've also tried to uh, balance it so that um, in terms of region, we just went with the provinces and territories. So we could have done it so you could look up, let's say, donors in Vancouver, but we didn't have very good data for certain provinces. They don't necessarily give you the city of the donor. So just to make it really easy, you, you can only look by year, you can only look by province. We played at one point uh, letting people even look at like the week a donation was made, but no one knows that. Like unless you made the donation, you don't know that. Um, but yeah, I mean, totally open to, you know, we're hoping to update it uh, about once a year. So the more user-friendly we can make it, the better. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely gonna bug Roberto uh, for some of those examples he used because it's really beautiful. The, the I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, follow the money, which is you could really do with a map, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, so, sorry, Zane, can you how long, how many people were involved and how much time were, was involved in in making that database? Um, so. Building that is what I did full time for about, or half time for 12 months. So the way that the fellowship that I was on works, you spend half your time working on uh, stories, National Post, and the other half working on a project. So most of that was me. Um, and then we also, because of limited resources, partnered with a uh, data visualization company called Click, which does things like this, usually on the more, uh, the more corporate side. Also, they've done visualizations like this for us in the past. So there's a team of three people there working for like the last three months on it. Um, and then in sort of, I'd say the last 30 days, there's maybe a dozen people who are doing things like finding interesting nuggets um, and, uh, you know, a small army of copy editors on things like the top 10 lists to make sure that yes, in fact, uh, you know, John Smith was the director, the same person of these two companies and therefore we can count his donation as one, that kind of thing. You know, um, the, the BBC and, and the Bureau Local produce, uh, I, I, they call them by different names, a background or, or a story recipe. And yeah. um, so it, it just kind of gives local news organizations a, a formula for how to, you know, what do you want to search? What does this tell you? How do you make yeah. the story out of it? And I'm just even thinking like even, um, yeah, within this, I, I mean, it's something that, that I think would probably increase your downloads. Of the database. No. Um, I mean, so there's a 2000 word methodology section. But oh, I did see that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, and uh, hopefully, uh, sort of, it, it'll, there'll be some uh, benefit uh, there. But um, we are, yeah, that's, that's, totally, that's a totally fair point. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. Can I ask another question? Are there, are there any other questions out there? Oh, um, so I'm intrigued. Um, like at the very beginning, um, April sort of threw out this word crowdsourcing and then moved on, but nobody else has talked about it. Um, and I wonder when in the sort of milieu now, you've all I, literally every one of you identified the issue around the availability of material, the availability as, of data as being a sort of a fundamental um, challenge to journalists throughout the country right now. So what was the potential role that crowdsourcing might play uh, within access to data that you can craft and create meaningful stories around? Um, I recognize this is something that we've been talking about within the realm of journalism for the last 10 years or so, but I wonder now sort of within the context of big data, uh, within the uh, you know within the context of sort of new forms of, of, of presentation and, and interaction, um, whether this is something that we need to revisit within the sort of context of, of, the, of the sort of data landscape. Well, I mean, I might jump in on this just a very brief answer and say I think it's at least from the pers my perspective, teaching and 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 working with data. It's going to depend on on the the project. It's going to depend on what you're doing. And you know, if the data doesn't exist, then I think crowdsourcing can be a, a quite an effective way of gathering uh, some data. We've done it in the past. Uh, did it with uh, we were working on uh, some material with uh, the municipal elections 
uh, and uh, I guess it was more of a survey, but essentially we surveyed everybody who had run for council and municipalities across the province and got them to fill out a, a Google sheet, which then built a data set of attributes about those people. Uh, so now it was all self-volunteered information, so you had to be aware of that. Um, so I, I think it can be very useful, especially, you know, in smaller places, such as the, the ones that April, you know, is talking about with her work, uh, you know, to, um, you know, you can reach out and build data sets that where, where data sets may not exist. So, you know, in, uh, in, in Toronto, you've got a robust open data portal. Montreal is a pretty good one. Vancouver, excellent one. You go to some small communities in Canada and uh, the town may not be gathering much data and there, there may not be data of the kind you're looking for. So crowdsourcing could be one way of gathering it for sure. Um, one of the things I'm just working on now is a, a piece that's examining the extent to which the local news map has, um, when we, when John and I were creating it, we thought, well, it could do two things. One is generate data that's just not available and what's happening across the country to local news organizations. And I, I think it, it has done that. And then the other was to what extent does it uh, fuel and generate local engagement and discussion about what's happening to local journalism. But I, I think what we found and uh, is that most of the people who are engaging with the map are already engaged in the idea of local journalism. So there may be journalists that work in the field, um, or people who are pretty engaged already with the issue. So, um, you know, it's not, we're not getting sort of a, a wide cross section of the population jumping in to say, oh, I got to add this to the map. I mean, partly it's, it's just that whole question of how do you make it accessible and make people aware of it, uh, which is just a constant problem for, for, for all of these sorts of, of, of projects and initiatives on the web. It's, uh, I've, there's even a term for it, which I, of course, forget. But, you know, oh, people's awareness that, that, that it exists. And then people, the amount of time people are willing to, again, uh, to Ro Roberto's earlier point, invest in, in even just taking the time to add a marker to the map. Mm. But I've spent quite a bit of time over the past week talking to um, uh, political parties, but also a bunch of, um, I don't know the right word is, but the groups like Ernst Cliff who do things like opposition research. So I mean, we hadn't really thought of it, but uh, the specific database has been a bonanza for people who are trying to find, let's say, questionable donations by people they're running against. Um, but on the, from a crowdsourcing perspective, it's interesting, like there's a couple of them which have tasked a small army of interns to look at it for a week because they want to make sure that they find out things about themselves before someone else does. But from a maybe more like civic minded perspective, there's two professors I'm talking to right now, one in Saskatchewan, one in PEI, who are working on things because those are both areas which, there are parts of the country that have had searchable databases before, like Quebec had a pretty good one, BC had a good one, uh, but there was nothing in, in most of the country. So um, I don't know, we've sort of had success after the fact and it's only been a week of sort of crowdsourcing some of the things that people are focusing on. And, you know, the woman that I work at in Saskatchewan is great. So we're not focusing on that this week, doing a lot of the work for us, which is perfect. Qu quickly, Zane, as well, do, do, you, do you monitor the types of queries that people are putting into the database? Um, I don't, but I have a colleague who does. Uh, and um, I know that we, we're trying to also mine that because there's enough traffic on it. Like we ask people to email us, but they won't necessarily. If someone is looking at, let's say all of, I don't know, people who donated to Justin Trudeau or whatever, and they keep focusing on one specific donor. In, in theory, it's the kind of thing that we should be able to, um, uh, my colleague Bryce Hall, who's brilliant, has uh, built this spreadsheet of it. Um, and I, I don't know quite how many times someone needs to search it, but if someone searched a number of times, then um, uh, we're gonna look at it. I think we're gonna do it once a week. So yeah. Fascinating. Yeah? So we have uh, just under 10 minutes left for, for questions and we have quite a few on our um, Q and A feed. So I just want to remind our panelists that if you have a moment um, to, to type in a few answers there, since we probably won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but I did want to ask uh, one of the questions that's on there, maybe combine it with the following one. So, one question that was asked, going back to this idea of the user experience of data journalism, 
Um, Majid had asked, and Roberto answered in written form, but I wanted to give everybody a chance. Is there some kind of method or ways that you find that are more effective in communicating these visual graphics or these maps that you're working with for readers? And um, a second at anonymous attendee asked, and which I would add to this question, do you have any evidence of how some methods might be more effective than others? And I, I know they asked for statistics, but even anecdotal evidence I think might be interesting. I will uh, answer this one quickly. So there is no one visualization type that is known to be the best visualization type, right? It really changes, it really varies on the data. Is it, do you wanna show a trend over time? Do you wanna show proportions to a whole? Do you want to show uh, where things flow from one to the other, right? Each of these it calls for a different type of visualization. And there are visualization types that are known to work best for the type of information you want to convey. Um, uh, so so the, question, the, the answer is it really varies by what you want to, uh, what you want to show. Uh, but, but at the same time, there are also well-known uh, theories and, um, and principles of human, percep of human visual perception, of how the human brain interprets information visually, right? We are better at uh, determining relative quantities by a size of something on a similar axis than by the angle of something on a pie chart, for example. So that's why many times pie charts are discouraged from using. So these are all things that can be learned. It's out there. There are books on it. You know, there. Edward Tufte is one of the great uh, granddaddies of you know information design. He's, uh, required reading for anybody who wants to visualize information like that. Um, and it's also with practice. You just start. You know. You 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 develop an instinct of what is the best way to represent an information visually. I might jump in on this as well, um, you know, sort of jumping off a little bit of uh, what you were just uh, uh, saying there. I think, uh, I think, that, and also riffing off a little bit of Roberto's sort of uh, sort of uh, gallery of mistakes we saw earlier, um, and 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 one particular one that that I often talk about with my students is the the uh, incredible overuse of choropleth maps um, by journalists. Um, it, it seems like it's the easiest thing to learn how to do. You know, you sort of make a Google Fusion table and there you go, you've got a map that's colored. And, and of course, you know, the problem is that journalists often don't understand some of the principles underlie these that you're going to have to try and represent some kind of rate for this. So we see all kinds of maps that are just raw numbers, which mean nothing. And also uh, the whole idea of different size areas being represented. So you see this very common, I mean, a great example of that is the famous US electoral map, which is more a categorical map, but you know, you see all this sea of red, a little bit of blue, and you think, whoa, the Republicans are completely have overwhelmed the U.S. Uh, electorate. And in reality, of course, the, the, the rural areas. And the, the trouble is, you know, is that you can explain that, but the eye will see what the eye will see, <laughs> uh, whether you have a nice explanation underneath or not. And I, and I think that I agree with Roberto that journalists working with this stuff need to do a little bit more uh, research, dig a little further to understand what they're doing and what they're showing. Um, uh, you see inappropriate colors being used. Uh, uh, so there's all sorts of different ways that we can make better use of the tools that exist. But I agree, there's no one tool that's the best one. It really depends what you're trying to show. So I think uh, I, I will ask one uh, more question from our attendees before we wrap up today. Um, and this question was directed at Zane, but I think I'll broaden it slightly. And I know during, during your talk, Zane, you mentioned that um, journalists often are confronted with the choice of what stories to tell based on the fact that they might not have time or resources to be able to tell all of the stories they might like. And having worked as a journalist myself, I know that this is, you know, really um, a very salient fact. And I'm wondering um, for all of you, and for Zane in particular, what are some of the stories that, you're, that you end up missing? And how does data journalism perhaps allow you to tackle you know, more of the stories that you would 
like to make sure are shared with your readers or with your audiences? I guess I'll start. Um, so it's just finishing up uh, the typing answer to that question as, as you started. Um, I think uh, on this project, but also in general, uh, there's often a focus on sort of power sources. So for example, a lot of the conversations I've been having over the past week are who's funding the Liberal or Conservative or NDP. Um, the Green Party, uh, the Federal Green Party gives quite a bit of money to its provincial counterparts uh, in some years probably keeping them going. Um, in smaller regions like uh, Newfoundland or PEI, they do get quite a bit of money from other parts of Canada. Um, and I don't know I'm quite interested in, um, it sort of goes back to what April was talking about, some of these regions that just don't have as much focus anymore. Like I've, I've got a, a friend who's working at the Yukon News right now and you know, the number, the, the volume of stories she has to put out every day is absurd. So yes, like, um, we not only have a Toronto Montreal focus, but I think we have a focus on, um, sort of like the places where journalists aren't even journalists that are doing coverage and that sort of nominally is on those issues. Uh, it often gets missed, missed, you know, uh, the globe doesn't have Atlantic Canada coverage anymore. McLean's hasn't for a decade makes a huge difference. Um, and um, you no, know, it's where other people can maybe fill in the gap. That's me for now. Okay, um, unless other folks have thoughts on that question, we can move on to, to wrapping up. We've just got a few minutes left here in our session. Um, and I just wanted to note in response to one question we got from attendees that um, the links that were shared, I think in a number of the presentations, but uh, the question was geared for Roberto, will be shared um, if the panelists have a moment to share some of the links to those great visualizations on the chat box, or you can email them to me. I will make sure they get posted on our website. Um, but first I wanted to really thank everybody for joining us today. I think it was a really vibrant and interesting session. Um, and the discussion in particular, I think, was, was quite fascinating for those who are learning about data journalism and, and, uh, and thinking about the issues that it confronts. Um, two two uh, quick items before I turn everything over to John Corbett for our final thoughts. Um, the first is that we will have two more GeoThink and Learn sessions in April and in May. Um, so the session in late April will actually be focused around citizen science and our session in May will be focused on urban intelligence. Um, and as well, as I said at the beginning of the session, this entire um, proceedings has been recorded and will be posted on our website. So feel free to share it widely and we of course will be doing so as well. Um, so now that uh, I finished those couple messages, I also wanted to thank our panelists for joining us today. It was really a wonderful discussion and I'd like to now turn it over to John Corbett for his final concluding thoughts. Excellent, and, and Drew, I'd just like to thank you and Sonia as well for putting this on and putting all of these talks on. I think they're a super opportunity for both us as well as our students to, to learn about you know, the really fascinating work being done, not just in universities, but also you know, in major news organizations throughout the country. So thanks for doing that. Um, I, I, in some ways, you know, that for me, there a number of themes have emerged through every single one of these presentations. But to start with, I think both Zane and April really pointed out that there, there is an issue going on right now in regards to journalists being able to access a diversity of information. Um, you know, um, April said very clearly, we've got a four to one trend around closures versus the opening of new, of news, of new news organizations. And I think that that's, that's really significant. Um, but I, but I also think that uh, Roberto and also Fred. I know Fred. You, you know, you defined yourself as being from the sort of prehistoric days of data journalism. But I completely disagree with that. I thought your project was absolutely fascinating. Um, but, but I think though, uh, for me, what, what really came out clearly, you know, through through certainly Roberto's work, Zane's work, as, as well as Fred's work, is this 
of retrenchment of, of, of journalists going back to what fundamentally um, you know, they are about, and that is storytelling. It's working with complex data, it's working with innovative approaches, it's about bringing young people into addressing important issues, even if they're historical, and starting to rethink about how we can tell the stories in different ways. I thought, Roberta, you provided us with a really nice um, you know, understanding that the stories need to be laser focused. We can't just let people craft their own stories, but we actually need to be telling the stories. But of course, you know, I mean, that's fundamentally what journalism has been about forever. I mean, of course, the stories that we create are the stories that were defined by the particular mandate of the institutions that we represent, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but anyway, um, certainly from my perspective as well, um, you know, we work a, a lot around the creation of these large maps um, which do fundamentally, you know, allow or enable, or I was going to say force now, um, the users to create their own stories because all of the data is actually contributed by citizens. But citizens, going back to April's point, that also clearly coalesce around specific issues. And I think that that's an important thing as well is that, you know, in a very general sense, when we think about, you know, access to new stories, nationally and internationally, we can be very vague about, about sort of who our audience might be. But I think as well, for example, we're looking at April's work when we're dealing with a very specific issue, you know, the, the um, aggregation of, 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 of new sources into a very few number of organizations, the issues are a lot more focused. But I'd like to, to just reiterate what, um, what Zane said, sorry, what uh, Drew said. Um, I really would like to thank every one of the speakers. I learned so much from all of you today. Um, each of you told such an excellent and, and interesting story, and, and I feel um, we're all richer because of it. So thank you all for your work, and thank you for your presentations. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. A pleasure. Thanks for having me take part of this. Thank you. Thanks so thank very you. much. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers.